Thank you. And today, Laura is going to tell us all about jets, please. Shall I start? Yes, please. Yes, yeah, so, hi. Um, for those of you that don't, meet, don't know me, uh, I'm Laura Cope. I'm currently a research fellow at the University of Leeds. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about some work that I did whilst I was a PhD student here in Cambridge, where I worked with Peter Haynes, looking at the dynamics of zonal jets or jet streams. So first of all, what are zonal jets? Well, there's strong currents in fluid flowing in the east-west or the zonal direction. And they can be seen uh, in this video on my slide here, which shows the atmosphere of Jupiter. And the alternating east-west currents that you can see are zonal jets. So jets naturally arise in a variety of different systems um, throughout the solar system. Uh, for example, they're observed in the atmospheres of the gaseous giant planets, for example, on Jupiter and Saturn. And on Earth, we have, for example, the mid-latitude jet stream in the Earth's atmosphere, and there are multiple jets in the Antarctic circumpolar current in the oceans. Now, the mid-latitude jet stream in the Earth's atmosphere plays a key role in our climate system. And so understanding its behavior or its variability is one of the key factors towards understanding our climate. And so this leads me on to the main question that I was trying to answer in my research, which was, what insights can we learn about the time variability of jet streams using idealized models? So observations of jet streams throughout the solar system reveal different types of variability and also different timescales of variability. So for example, on Jupiter, um, the jets are observed to be very steady in both space and time. Um, just over 40 years ago, um, the Voyager mission to Jupiter collected data looking at the strength um, of these zonal winds. Uh, which I've plotted here. And you can see these sharp uh, eastward and westward peaks. And then about 20 years later, the Cassini mission to Jupiter also collected data looking at the strength of these winds. And the two data sets are remarkably similar, which suggests that the strengths, the positions, and the numbers of these jets have remained virtually constant over these two decades. In the Earth's oceans, um, the jets are observed to vary over time scales of the orders of months. Um, and this figure here shows the variability of jets, or rather sea surface height anomalies, um, in the Southern Ocean. And to explain the plot in more detail, what the authors have done is they've considered a single line of longitude between South Australia and Antarctica, and they've plotted over a period of time, so for example this year here, the time variability of these jets. And you can see that there is a certain amount of variability. So for example, at this point in time here, given by this white line, you can see that two jets here are starting to move towards each other and merging to form a single jet. And then just further south, you can see a new jet forming. Can I interrupt and just ask Yes, a you can, yes. So in that plot, they must have done some local averaging to, over like a week or so? Or? I think there was, but I can't quite remember the details of the paper. I would need to go back and check, but I think there was, yeah. yes, yeah. Yes, yeah, so, and then finally, in the Earth's atmosphere, um, the jets are observed to vary over time scales of the orders of days. Um, so I've compiled this movie here using data from this website, and a single second corresponds to a single Earth day. And you can see that there's a significant amount of variability um, on a daily basis. Okay, so the rough plan for the talk um, is as follows. I'm going to begin by introducing a very simple idealized system that's stochastic and fully nonlinear. 
and it's arguably one of the simplest systems that allows for the spontaneous formation and equilibration of jets. And we're going to take a look at this system and see what types of behaviour exist within this model. And then, in the, the next parts of the talk, we're going to try to diagnose certain aspects of behaviour. And to do so, we're going to systematically eliminate uh, certain features, so for example, nonlinear interactions. So in the second part, I'm going to introduce the quasi-linear approximation and show you what happens in this system. And then we're going to proceed to have a look at a generalised version of the quasi-linear approximation. And then finally, I'll conclude. So let's begin by focusing on an idealised, fully nonlinear system. Um, but before I do so, um, I first of all need to introduce to you the concept of the beta plane approximation. Okay? So let's consider a rotating planet with a planetary rotation vector aligned with the axis of rotation. <coughs> now, at any particular latitude on the planet, this rotation vector can be decomposed into a local vertical component and a local horizontal component. And it's the local vertical component that's important for the large-scale horizontal dynamics. And if we consider how this local vertical component varies with latitude, you can see that as you move from the pole down towards the equator, its magnitude is decreasing. Now, a really common approach in simple models is to instead treat this latitudinal variation uh, as being equal to a constant, so with gradients beta, okay? This is known as the beta plane tangent plane approximation. Okay, so the model that I'm going to be talking about today that will form the basis of the entire talk uh, can be summarised as follows. So we're going to incorporate the effects of planetary rotation via the beta plane tangent plane approximation uh, and I'm going to be using doubly periodic boundary conditions. Uh, we're going to incorporate the effects of turbulence via a small scale stochastic force. Okay, And because we're continuously injecting energy into the system via the stochastic force, uh, we're going to use uh, friction as a way to dissipate energy so that the system can reach an equilibrium energy level. So these are the three ingredients required um, for the spontaneous mm -hmm. formation and equilibration of jets uh, within this model. So I'm now going to show you a short video from one of my numerical simulations so you can see the spontaneous emergence um, of these jets. Are you going so to say more Laura, about the forcing? Are you going to... I'm going to say a little bit more, not a huge amount, but a bit more on the next slide. Yes, yeah. yeah. So we're going to be continuously forcing the model at small scales, stochastically. And you can see that these larger scale coherent structures are appearing. Uh, so the yellow fluid uh, is moving to the east and the blue to the west. And over time, these structures are starting to become elongated in the zonal or the east-west direction. Now, at this point, you can see the emergence of a single yellow eastward jet here, two yellow eastward jets here, and two blue westward flows. And shortly, these two jets are going to merge to form a single jet and so in this particular simulation, we're going to equilibrate with two yellow eastward jets and two blue westward flows. Now, in my talk, I'm going to be focusing on the yellow eastward jets, and I'm going to be studying their long-time behaviour. So this model uh, can be described by a single equation of motion given here, which is the vorticity equation for vorticity equal to z to here. 
Uh, so uh, we have uh, the nonlinear advection term, which is where uh, interesting things happen. Uh, we have a term, beta effect term, due to the planetary rotation. Uh, we have a stochastic forcing function. I'm incorporating linear friction. And then finally, I'm using hyperviscosity as a way of dissipating the buildup of energy at the smallest scales. And there are three parameters in this system. So there's beta, which is the background gradient of potential vorticity. There's the energy injection rate epsilon due to the forcing. And then there's the damping rate mu. Okay, now just a very brief note about the stochastic forcing that I'm using in this model. Um, it's white noise in time, and I'm forcing the system both isotropically and homogeneously. So I'm forcing a narrow annulus of wave vectors uh, in Fourier space um, with randomized phases. And this corresponds to small scale forcing um, in physical space. Yes. Randomized phases in time or also at each k? At um, each k and also in time. So at every time step, it's a brand new uh, forcing function. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to take a brief note now to explain to you how you can interpret the results of my numerical simulations. So on the left hand side of the slide here, I'm showing snapshots in time of the zonal components of the velocity fields, where as before, the yellow fluid is flowing to the east and the blue to the west. If you take the zonal average of the plots on the left, you obtain the plots in the center here, which show the jet velocity profile. And in this particular case, a single jet has formed and it's here. And then if you plot this at each instance in time, you can build up these latitudes time plots, such as the one shown on the right here, where I'm going to emphasize that time will always be evolving along the horizontal axis, okay? Now these latitude time plots clearly show the evolution of the jets that spontaneously form within the simulation. In this particular case, a single jet has formed, um, but you can change the parameters, and so you can see um, different numbers of jets appearing. Okay, so let's take a look at some results. Um, so I've run this model over a broad range of parameters, and I've tried to categorize the simulations uh, in terms of the, the main types of variability that we observe. So for example, uh, we see cases of uh, random wandering behavior. So the jets are just randomly wandering north or south um, throughout the domain. Uh, we also see examples of uh, merging events. So two jets approach each other and then they merge to form a single jet. And then also we see this nucleation behavior, so new jets forming. But both of these types of behavior have already been observed in uh, previous studies that use similar models. The new part is that we see this new type of variability, so we're observing migration behavior, okay? And in this particular example, a single jet has formed and it's systematically migrating either north or south with a constant speed. And as you can see, it also has the capacity to spontaneously change its direction of migration. Okay, so this is the first main result of my talk today, which is that we see this new type of variability. We observe zonal jet migration behavior. You're going to tell us how this happens? That is the point of the talk today. Right. <laughs> At least I'm going to try to tell you. Yes. Okay, so yeah, as I've just been saying, that is going to form the main objective of my talk today, to try to understand this behaviour um, in more detail. Could, could I ask? I, yes. I assume that the, the effect of the 
you're seeing in these jets, he's critically dependent on having beta non zero. Uh, if you switch off beta, the beta. If plane. you switch off beta and you have a square domain, um, then you would see the formation of large scale water seas. Yes. So um, we're just back to ordinary yes. Stokes. And I believe, and David will perhaps know more about this than I do, that if you change the aspect ratio of the domain, you can actually start to see jet-like behaviour. So there might be an aspect ratio dependence, I'm, I'm not too sure. But certainly in square domains, it's, it's large-scale vortices. Okay. Yeah. What was the difference, Laura, maybe you said, sorry, on, what were you actually doing differently in those three? Uh, simply changing different parameters. So you've got three parameters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Are you going to tell us? Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't got the parameters on the slides. Yes, okay. It's not particularly important for the, the purpose of this, but uh, those are just three examples, and there's many similar examples. It's kind of important. It changes everything. <laughs> it does, yeah. Okay, so um, I'd like to show you um, how all of my simulations fit into um, parameter space. Um, but before I do so, I'm going to introduce two important parameters in this system. Uh, so the first important parameter is called the Rhine scale. And it's uh, now very strongly believed to be related to the spacing between the jets that emerge, okay? So to see uh, how this works, um, we're forcing the system at very small scales or, or large wave number. And then because we're working in a two-dimensional system, we have an inverse cascade of energy to larger scales or smaller wave numbers. And at these smallest scales, the effects of rotation are not felt by the system. So energy is transferred isotropically to larger scales. But there becomes a length scale at which the effects of rotation do start to become important. Uh, given by uh, this wave number here. And for scales larger than this wave number, or this wavelength, so smaller wave numbers, um, energy instead uh, is transferred anisotropically uh, by the inverse cascade. So it's preferentially flowing into the zonal rather than the latitudinal scales, so rather into the x than the, the y direction. The scale, the inverse cascade, ultimately stops, however, when the effects of friction um, become important. Uh, and th that's given by this wave number here, uh, which is the Rhine's wave number, or related to the Rhine scale. Okay? And that's believed uh, to be related to the spacing between the jets. Can you say what U is? Uh, U is uh, the typical... Uh, zonal velocity. So it's, it's basically it's a measured quantity, and you can't get that from the parameters that you input. It's, uh, I mean, you can in theoretically relate it to the parameters. Some people uh, talk about this as like an emergent property. Others uh, talk about um, instead relating it to the original parameters. But yeah, there, there is a theoretical relationship between you uh, and the parameters in the system. So let's see how the Rhine scale affects the system in practice. So I've taken four examples here of different simulations. And in each one, the Rhine's wave number, this is a theoretical number that comes out of the parameters. This is systematically increasing in each simulation. And as you can see, as the Rhine's wave number increases, so does the number of jets, okay? So the spacing between the jets is decreasing. And this can also be seen on the right-hand side here, where I've plotted um, for a range of different simulations that I've run, each dot is a single simulation, I plotted the theoretical Rhine's wave number against the actual number of jets that we observed. And you can see that there's a fairly good relationship between the two, uh, given by this expression here, with a certain amount of variability around this. Okay? So that was the Rhine scale. Um, the second important parameter, which I'm going to talk about, is called the zonostrophy parameter. 
And you can think of it as a measure of the strength of the jets. Uh, so the zonostrophy parameter is defined to be the ratio of the wave number at which the effects of rotation become important divided by the Rhine's wave number. Okay? So you can think of it as a measure of this inverse uh, anisotropic cascade range. Now, for large zonostrophy or a larger uh, inverse anisotropic cascade range, uh, we observe stronger jets. But for smaller zonostrophy, um, the jets are weaker. And to see this in practice, um, let's take a look at a couple of simulations um, from this study here by Richard Scott and David Dritchell, where um, they were looking at um, the formation of well, staircase type structures actually, but um, uh, these are two simulations run at different zonostrophy parameters. And on this left hand side here, um, they plotted the vorticity field. And you can see at smaller zonostrophy, uh, there's much more uh, chaotic motions and a much greater range um, of spatial scales. Whereas at larger zonostrophy, uh, you're seeing a more orderly flow and much more sort of layering type dynamics. And as a smaller side, you can see how this relates to the idea of staircasing if you look at the potential vorticity profile. So this is defined to be the sum of the zonally averaged vorticity field plus a component uh, due to the planetary rotation, so this beta term here. And you can see that, um, well, uh, in the absence of uh, vorticity, with just the beta term, you would have a linear profile, but instead you're getting this uh, staircasing type uh, profile. And this is becoming more pronounced as you go to higher zonostrophy. So the steps are becoming uh, far more uh, sort of step-like um, at higher zonostrophy. Okay, so going back to zonostrophy in terms of my simulations, um, well, I find that uh, for larger zonostrophy, um, it, as before, each dot corresponds to a single simulation. Um, for larger zonostrophy, the fraction of energy in the mean flow, so in the jets, um, is increasing. So at larger zonostrophy, more of the, uh, the, the jets are much stronger um, relative to the underlying eddy field. And there is actually a theoretical analytical relationship between these two, um, given by this expression here, but I don't have time um, to go into that today. Yes. In practice, we change that by changing the ratio of dissipations at small scale versus large scale, or like you, it looks like you're so small scales. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, so here, this is the expression for zonostrophy. So you can change it by changing any one of the three parameters um, in the system. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, going back to the parameter space for the simulations that I've run, um, here it is. Um, I've got zonostrophy along the vertical axis and the Rhine's wave number along the horizontal. And each dot or circle uh, corresponds to a single simulation that's been color coded according to the number of jets that were observed. And you can see that there's a good relationship, as I said earlier, between the numbers of jets and the Rhine's wave number. Now it can be helpful to see how. Yes? I'm stuck, I'm not stuck, struck <laughs> at those exponents on zonostrophy. Yes. are clearly correct, but it's a re it seems like a remarkably re rigid quantity. Right? Those are, those are, I mean, amazing exponents, one tenth, <laughs> one twentieth. I mean, how can't possibly change much, right? Um, I mean, it's it turns out to be a remarkably good predictor, actually, as the types of dynamics that you would expect to see. 
Fine, but yeah. I mean, I, I, but you know, you're talking about how you change it. I think yes. you really have to scan something over quite a dynamic range. To yeah, do I mean, anything. yeah, the the, own, the exponents are certainly uh, well <laughs> unusual, um, but that's I guess what it turns out to be. What is mu in your? Uh, mu is the frictional damping rate. Okay. Yeah. It may be closer to Patrick's point. I, I guess the question is when you did change your zonostropy over that mm. rather large range from one to four, mm. was it just by changing mu or did you actually say. I've changed all beta? the parameters. So you actually changed beta by a factor of a million or something? Or? Not in my simulations, no. <laughs> um, that's that's what Because that, that's yeah. another point. So, really, it, with a mu change, you can. So I changed epsilon by a factor of 100, wow. beta by about a factor of 10, and mu by, that could have been 1,000 or 10,000 or so. Yeah. That's yeah. probably primarily mu is what's giving you that, yeah. that yeah. range. I'm assuming. Yeah. yeah. That's a big, big change in damping. Mm, yeah. So let's see how this diagram so relates just to... Just to pick yes. up on Bruce's yeah. point. Yeah. Um, so you, you have now books um, where you had a capital U before, which was like an output parameter. You have now made the time scale yes. a function of input parameters. That, that link to you. Exactly, is yes. There is a theoretical the relationship. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's see how um, this parameter space corresponds to uh, the naturally existing jets in the solar system. So uh, in the Earth's atmosphere, uh, the zonostrophy is estimated to be somewhere between one and two. So these are very weak jets. In the Earth's oceans, uh, it's around about two, so they're slightly stronger in the oceans. However, on the gaseous giant planets uh, like Jupiter, etc., the zonostrophy is much higher. So values start at around about five, uh, but they go upwards to, to 10 and possibly even higher than that. Okay, so much stronger jets um, on those planets. So one question, we, uh, oh, one question we might like to ask is, which out of these simulations show jet migration behavior? Yes. Uh, due to David's point as well, the first time you showed this K well, uh, Rhines, you had U, and now you have the, the energy injection rate. Yes. And it's, um, the the, the, okay, there is a reason for this because I've given this talk a number of times. Mm -hmm. Some people think of it in terms of big U, which is an emergent quantity, and some people like to think of things in terms of the, the input parameters. And uh, when you end up putting slides together, sometimes you find that you're not quite being 100% consistent between them. <laughs> That's fine, but the point is now you have it as um, you know, your, your choice of injection. Where, for what scales, for what rate, etc., you inject. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're saying in Jupiter it's way up there, etc. Yeah. But the injection rate is probably not on the small scale, not for the very as you as you do. So, how confident are you in estimating all of those numbers? Saying, you know, Earth is in this parameter range, Jupiter in that band. Yeah. So the, these um, the uh, these estimates here are not estimates that I have produced. I mean, there will be certainly variability around those and how much variability, I'm not too sure. Um, but when you sort of scan the literature, these are the kind of numbers that tend to pop up. Um, but of course, I mean, they're, they're not sort of hard and fast rules. So you will get weaker jets than those in the oceans, um, maybe stronger uh, sometimes in the atmosphere than that, etc. Maybe you'll come to this, yeah. but it, is there a connection between zonostrophy and jet stability? I don't believe so, no. 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 
Yeah. Okay, so um, as I was saying, um, we could ask which out of these simulations show migration behavior. And it turns out to be these ones here. So you can see that migration is happening over these sub-intervals um, of the Rhine scale. So to summarize parameter space in terms of um, migration, we see that um, as the Rhine's wave number increases, you can see increasing numbers of jets migrating. Uh, whereas uh, as the zoonostrophy changes, well, for larger zoonostrophy, um, the jets are behaving more deterministically, but as the zoonostrophy decreases, um, they're behaving in a more stochastic nature. So they're able to change direction um, much more frequently. Okay. Now, you might be wondering that, okay, we've seen migration behavior in this really simple, idealized model, but do jets also migrate uh, in more complex systems? And it turns out that, yes, they do. So, for example, um, general circulation models, which are um, spherical geometry, um, studies have observed um, both the poleward migration of jets and also the equatorward uh, migration of jets. And then finally, uh, in, the, uh, in terms of observations, well, there haven't been any um, observations of jets migrating in the Earth's oceans, but there have been hints of migration in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, so, for example, this study here looked at the uh, time evolution of the angular momentum anomalies uh, in the Earth's atmosphere. And you can see these hints of migration <laughs> from the equator towards the South Pole. Where would that be in the atmosphere? Stratosphere or troposphere? Um, I believe that was in the troposphere, but I would need to go back. I think it was in the troposphere. Yes. Okay, so we've observed this new type of behavior in this, this idealized, fully nonlinear system. So now we're going to try to understand this behavior in more detail. So the first approach that we're going to take is we're going to consider um, a quasi-linear version of the model. So we're going to, we're going to neglect all eddy-eddy interactions um, and see what happens uh, in this particular case. Okay, so the quasi-linear model can be described as follows. We're going to allow non-linear interactions between uh, zonal wave numbers, uh, K, so eddies, and uh, the mean flow with zonal wave number equal to zero. But we're going to neglect interactions between the eddies or the, the zonal wave numbers greater than zero. So we're going to decompose each of the variables, so for example, the stream function, into the mean, so the zonal mean, and then perturbations away from the mean, okay? And then if we take our original vorticity equation, written here in terms of linear and nonlinear operators, we can derive evolution equations um, for the, the mean quantities uh, and also the eddies. And then the quasi-linear approximation neglects the eddy-eddy nonlinear or interaction terms from the evolution equations for the eddies. And this amounts to neglecting these same eddy-eddy interaction terms from the original vorticity equation. So we can derive a new quasi-linear vorticity equation given here which we can numerically integrate forwards in time uh, using the previously described procedure. So let's see what happens, okay? So just to recap, in the fully nonlinear system, we saw three types of uh, behavior. In the quasi-linear model, well, we still see this randomly wandering behavior. And we also still see uh, merging and nucleating jets. However, 
we no longer observe migration behavior. So this is a clear distinction between the two systems. By removing all eddy-eddy interactions, we've removed the possibility of migration behavior. Okay? And to see this again using a second set of uh, simulations, in these two uh, simulations, so the first one I've run with the nonlinear system, the second with the quasi-linear model, I've used the same parameters between these two simulations. <coughs> and in each case, as time increases from left to right, I'm linearly increasing the value of beta. So the Rhine's wave number is increasing from left to right. So we would expect to see increasing numbers of jets. And indeed we do. However, in the nonlinear model, as we transition from one to two jets, we see this migration behavior but we don't see this behavior in the quasi-linear system, okay? Is, is there any parametric trend in, in sort of the coherence of the migration? In other words, how long it goes in one direction before it reverses? So that depends on zoonostrophy. Ah. Yes, so stronger, higher zoonostrophy uh, they tend to keep going in the same direction much longer. So the, the probability of changing direction is inversely proportional to zoonostrophy, but I cannot quantify that in any more detail. Yeah. Okay, so we used a fully nonlinear system and we saw migration behavior. We then looked at the quasi-linear model where we neglected all eddy-eddy interactions and migration behavior disappeared. So some of those interactions are clearly important for the behavior. So to try to understand this further, we're going to consider a generalization of the quasi-linear approximation. So this is a way of interpolating between the two systems and we're going to systematically neglect uh, eddy eddy interactions. So to explain this model uh, in more detail, what we're going to do is we're going to consider all of the zonal wave numbers in the system. And we're going to decompose these into two different sets. So in the first set, which I'm going to call the low modes, we're going to put the largest zonal scales or the smallest wave numbers. And then in the second set, we're going to put uh, the smaller scales or the remaining wave numbers. And then we're going to define a separation wave number, which I'm going to call lambda. And lambda is the largest wave number in the low modes. And then the trick is that we're going to allow fully nonlinear interactions between the low modes and we're going to allow certain interactions between the low and the high modes and neglect certain interactions between the high modes uh, chosen in such a way that the original conservation properties of the system, so for example the energy, um, are retained. So mathematically speaking, uh, we're going to decompose each of our variables into these low and high modes which I'm going to denote with letters L and H. And then if we take once again our vorticity equation, uh, we can decompose this into evolution equations for the low and the high modes. And then the trick is that we're going to neglect these interaction terms between these high modes from the evolution equations for the high modes. And just as before, this is equivalent to neglecting these same interaction terms from the original vorticity equation. So we can derive a generalized quasi-linear vorticity equation that we can numerically integrate forwards in time. So just to see how this fits into the hierarchy of models, 
We began by looking at the fully nonlinear model. So lambda here is equal to n or the numerical resolution. And we're allowing all possible nonlinear interactions between zonal wave numbers here. We then looked at the quasi-linear model where lambda was equal to zero. Okay? So in this system, we're only allowing interactions between the jets and the zonal scales that are directly forced. And now we're looking at a generalized quasi-linear model where we're only neglecting certain nonlinear interactions. So let's see what happens uh, when we use uh, this generalized quasi-linear system. So I found an example of a simulation here where two jets are migrating north. <clears throat> this is from the fully nonlinear system. Okay. When we go to the quasi-linear model, as we would expect, the migration behavior disappears. Okay. However, if we then systematically increase the value of our separation wave number lambda, we immediately see the migration behavior is restored. And in fact, the properties of the migration have also been restored. So for example, the migration speed of the jets. So this is the second main result in my talk, which is that migration requires lambda to be greater than or equal to one um, in the generalized quasi-linear framework. So to be clear, that lambda one means you have exactly one wavelength in your... So you have, wave. in the low modes, you've got the jet, which is the kx equals zero mode, and then you've got the kx equals one mode. Yeah, so basically one wavelength. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Just physically, yeah. isn't that simply a statement that you need some asymmetry along the jet or wiggling in along the direction of the jet for the jet to move? If, if you have lambda below one, you, you have that's, perfect symmetry and the jet can't move. That's exactly what I think it is, and I'm going to explain in a moment why okay, that's the case. But I mean, um, yes. Yeah. You could come to that conclusion on the basis of symmetry without, forgive me, without <laughs> the, the quasi-linear uh, exercise. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to try to convince you that that's the case, and we'll see how well I do yeah. with that. Okay, so, um, at this point, there's like a number of possible questions that we could ask, and I'm going to address two of them today. So the first question is, why do jets only migrate when lambda is greater than or equal to one? And the second question is, can we predict the speed at which the jets migrate? So let's focus to begin with on question one. But before I do so, I'd first of all like to introduce to you the concept of zonons. So zonons um, are essentially the generalization of Rosby waves uh, to flows that have latitudinal shear, okay? And the basic theory behind Rosby waves is that uh, we decompose the flow uh, into the, the zonally averaged flow and perturbations away from the, the zonal mean. And then we consider the evolution equation for the perturbations. Now, in a system that has no jets or no latitudinal shear, then this is simply a constant. And so in this particular case, this coefficient here is also a constant. And so we have a linear equation with solutions that are linear Rosby wave solutions. And this is standard textbook material. However, in the case where you do have latitudinal shear, or jets, then this coefficient is no longer a constant. And so in this particular case, the solutions take this more general form, and these are known as zonons. And just as Pat was alluding to, uh, they can be observed in this snapshot here of the zonal velocity field, where alongside this jet flowing in the east-west direction, you have a meandering of the jet uh, with wave number kx equals one, okay? So 
in the fully nonlinear system, we're allowing all possible nonlinear interactions. Energy can flow into all zonal wave numbers. So we would expect to see the formation of zonons in this system. In the generalized quasilinear model, well, we are neglecting some interactions, but we're still allowing the scattering of energy amongst the wave numbers uh, due to the inclusion of these additional modes here. And so we would also expect to see the formation of zonons in this uh, GQL model. However, in the quasilinear system, we only allow energy to transfer back and forth between the mean flow and the zonal wave numbers that are directly forced. So we would not expect to see energy to flow uh, into the modes related to the zonons. So we would not expect to see the formation of zonons um, in this particular system. Okay, so going back to the question, why do jets only migrate when lambda is greater than or equal to one? Well, let's consider three examples. So on the top here, I'm showing two jets migrating north, in the middle, two jets migrating south, and then on the bottom row, two non-migrating jets. And in the centre of the slide here, I'm showing snapshots in time of the zonal velocity field. Well, actually, what I've done is I've taken the square domain, I've squashed it in the zonal or the x direction, then I've tessellated it four times so that you can uh, sort of to visually enhance um, the physical features, okay? So when the jets migrate north, you can see that there are these strong patches of zonal velocity on the northern flanks of the jets. And in uh, the case where they go south, you instead see these patches on the southern side of the jets. And in this non-migrating case, then one of the jets has these patches on either side of it, okay? And this can be visualized to some degree um, also in the vorticity field. So here, in the uh, case where the jets are migrating north, you can see these coherent patches of red positive vorticity on the northern side of the jets. When they migrate south, you instead see patches of negative vorticity on the southern flanks of the jets. And in this non-migrating case, well, one of the jets is sandwiched between positive and negative patches of vorticity. Okay? But to what extent, uh, or how is this related uh, to the forcing um, of the jets themselves? Well, to answer this question, we're going to consider the evolution equation um, for the, the jet velocity profile where we see that the jets are forced by the Reynolds stress force. Now, quite conveniently, I found an example of a simulation where in the first half, a pair of jets were migrating north, and then they spontaneously stopped migrating. So for each half of this simulation, I've computed time averages in frames of reference that move with the jets, um, the Reynolds stress force, which I'm showing in pink, and the jet velocity profile. And you can see that when the jets migrate north, we have these bulges of the profiles on the northern side of the jets. So both the Reynolds stress force and the jets are asymmetric about the core of the jet. However, when the jets stop migrating, both the Reynolds stress force and the jets are symmetric about the core of the jet. So you can see that migration requires an asymmetric eddy forcing and a corresponding asymmetric mean flow. But to what extent are these asymmetries caused by the zonons in the system? Okay, so to answer this, what we're going to do is we're going to decompose the eddy field into the contributions from the zonons that have zonal wave number equal to one 
and the contributions from the remaining zonal wave numbers. Okay, so we're going to decompose the Reynolds stress force into the contributions from the zonons and these remaining zonal wave numbers. And then if we consider our Reynolds stress forcing profile, this is the full profile here, we can decompose this into the contribution from the zonons and the contribution from the remaining zonal wave numbers. And somewhat surprisingly, at least to me this was a surprise, the main contribution is actually coming from the remaining zonal wave numbers, not from the zonons. So we deduce, and this is the third main result of the talk, which is that zonons are actually playing an organisational role of the smaller scale eddies uh, in the jet's migration mechanism. Okay? Okay, so the second and final question that I'm going to address today is, can we predict the speed at which the jets migrate? <coughs> so, just to clarify, when I talk about migration speed, I'm talking about the change in latitude of the jet, so delta y, divided by the time taken delta t. We might hypothesize that the migration speed is equal to some function of the parameters in the system. Okay, so what I've done is I've taken data from a large number of simulations that show um, different numbers of jets migrating and also different speeds of migration. And um, I've tried to analyze the data and empirically, it turns out that there is a relationship between the migration speed and the parameters given by this expression here. But when you rearrange this, you see that the migration speed is actually proportional to the product of the damping rate times the Rhine scale, okay, or the spacing between the jets. And this is shown on the right-hand side here. So I plotted um, on log-log axis uh, the migration speed against this expression here for a wide range of simulations uh, with different numbers of jets migrating at different speeds. And you can see that there's a relationship between the two. Okay? So this is the fourth and final result of the talk, which is that the migration speed is given by an explicit expression. It's equal to the product of the damping rate times the Rhine scale. Is that, is that equivalent to the migration speed inverse with the zonostrophy? I mean, just multiply and divide it by the, the beta scale. Right? And you could write it as mu L beta divided by zonostrophy. So small zonostrophies don't go faster than big zonostrophy. So there was no connection between zonostrophy itself and migration speed. But if, I, if I just take your formula, yes. I can write it as L Rhines over L beta times L beta, and multiply and divide by L beta, and then L Rhines over yeah, L you beta could. Is, is, is the one over zonostrophy. So yes. Could, so I mean, it, it seems to be consistent with other things you said about zonostrophy. That's, I hadn't thought about that. That's a very interesting insight. Yeah. Thank you. you can work, I mean, that you can work with L beta instead of L lines, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, so just to briefly conclude, um, the objective of the work was the study of the variability of jet streams or zonal jets. Um, we've used um, one of the simplest possible systems uh, to study the behavior, which incorporates the effects of rotation, turbulence, and friction. And then we used two different approaches, or they're, they're related, uh, in order to diagnose aspects of the, uh, the variability. So we first of all looked at the quasi-linear approximation, 
where we neglected all eddy eddy interactions. And then we looked at the generalized quasilinear approximation, where we were able to systematically neglect only certain eddy eddy interactions. And in terms of results, well, we find this new type of variability. So we see jet migration in this very idealized model. Uh, migration requires lambda to be greater than or equal to one in the generalized quasilinear framework. We deduce that the zonons play an organizational role of the smaller scale eddies um, in the jet migration mechanism. And then finally, uh, the migration state uh, was found to be related to both uh, the damping rate, rather the product of the damping rate um, and the Rhine scale. And in terms of future work, well, uh, there's a number of different possible avenues. So for example, um, you could ask, is it possible to construct an even further reduced model uh, to reveal additional insights um, into this symmetry breaking mechanism. Um, moving away from the jet migration uh, idea, uh, you could instead explore the merging and nucleating behavior. And you could ask, why do some models, so for example, the one that I've talked about today, allow the nucleation events to occur, but other models uh, that we've seen in this program so far only allow merging events to take place. Uh, so, you know, you only see coarsening behavior. So what is included in this system that's absent from other systems? And then finally, and this is not something that I'm involved with myself, but I thought I would give a, a, a brief mention of um, Ira's work. Um, you could also employ the use of machine learning tools um, to try to analyze this um, or similar systems. And I'm hoping that Ivor will come and give us a talk um, at some point in the program. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be delighted to ask um, any further questions that you have. Very nice. Um, further questions? I have a comment, at least a comment. Um, I was interested to see the effect in your quasi-linear approximation. There's never, there are never Stokes results, I think it's due to Terence Tau, that if, if you restrict the wave number interactions, that regularizes Navier stokes solutions. And that's exactly what you'll see. You see uh, it suppresses the raggedness and the oscillations, and you have a much, you have a much smoother uh, sort of wave. So you're, you're seeing exactly that effect. And I think probably consistently also with the restriction on the eddy-eddy interactions, you're yes. restricting the high wave numbers. Yes. So I think what you're seeing is the right thing in that sense. It's Brilliant. consistent. Yeah, thanks very much for the comment. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so what we are looking at in terms of migration is the flux, okay. If, I'll try to get the directions that right. So this is the flux of momentum in the y direction of the momentum in the x direction, right? So yes, yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So uh, and when you see this kind of uh, linear behavior with, uh, um, so this suggests an off-diagonal term in the uh, expression for the momentum flux. Mm -hmm and which in your case it would be a pinch term because it's linear and not a diffusive term. So in, from the point of symmetry breaking, basically we are looking at a, let me get this right, a ky symmetry breaking. Mm -hmm. So a symmetry breaking in the ky yes. direction. Yes. And so, and it's clear that in quasi-linear theory, there is no symmetry breaking. Mm -hmm. So once you go beyond the quasi-linear theory, you can actually get yeah. this ky symmetry breaking. So in that sense, I think there is a relation between what we see in terms of symmetry breaking, for example, that I talked about in terms of k-parallel symmetry breaking. I think there is a very strong 
relation between the two. So it's a comment in the end. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's Don't certainly, ask me a question. it's an interesting comment, definitely. Yeah, yeah thanks a lot. Yeah. Yes, Pat. Yeah. So more on symmetry break then. I mean, you made the comment that the, zo the zonon organizes the turbulence. Yes. Yeah, or in particular, organizes the Reynolds stresses of yeah. the turbulence. So that, that begs for a footprint of the zonon in the cross phases of the Reynolds stresses in its vicinity. In other, word, in other words, that kind of thing occurs if you have a bunch of turbulence that's organized by its structure, basically it modifies the phases by some symmetry breaking mechanism, shear or whatever. The question is, have you looked for that? I haven't, no. I mean, there's all sorts of possible things that you could look at, and it's something that I would like to dig deeper into at some point. You could look as simple like at the correlation of the of the Reynolds stress, you know, coherence factors with the structural properties of the zonon. Mm -hmm. that, that wouldn't be too yeah. hard to do. Yeah, yeah, you could do. Yeah. Yeah, great, thank you. Please, yeah. Just look at dive into this lambda equals one. You just yeah. need one wavelength in yeah. there to get the migration. Mm -hmm. So just uh, two questions in that vein then. That doesn't matter what your um, zonoscopy parameter is. No. You, you focused on the sort of uh, steady migration cases, but even if it's zigzagging and a bit mm -hmm. more random. Yeah. Okay. Then the other question is, because it's under one, it really depends on the domain size. And then I'm wondering if it wasn't a square domain, mm -hmm. if it was a really long, rectangular it's, domain, it's something say four that times I have... longer, would it be lambda equals four, or would it still be lambda equals one? That's something that I have wondered, and it's a really good question to ask, to be honest. I mean, yeah, I have wondered, am I sort of, is there a sort of a natural wavelength that emerges, and am I being restricted because I'm looking at a square domain, and would you see additional wavelengths in a, a longer domain? I can't answer that question at the moment, but I think it's something that would be important to, to have a look at. Yeah. To what extent do you, would you need the generalized quasi-linear if you were to relax your isotropy uh, in the first place, the isotropic forcing? At the forcing. So you allow for some imbalance in the isotropy of the system. Would it just randomly meander or would it be able to migrate just with quasi -linear? Do you also mean the homogeneity of the forcing? Or are you just talking about isotropy? Any, any, I don't know. Um, Do you relax any... Because I think that if you, if you just realize, relax the isotropy, I don't think it would make much of a difference. That's my, that's my kind of, my feeling. But if you were to relax the homogeneity, that would, I think. Um, Can you explain what you mean by, by that? You have that circle of mm -hmm. putting stuff, so I sort of think, mm -hmm. I, I assume you mean it goes all around the circle. So I, I would, if you what relax isotropy, you would, um, rather than just focusing sort of uniformly around a circle, you would preferentially for, yeah. uh, for, um, force just certain parts of the circle. Right. Okay. What, is, what is relaxing homogeneity? Uh, so you'd be f instead focusing in physical space on just forcing sort of preferentially certain parts of the domain, or more strongly parts of the domain compared to others. Um, how that relates to the, the circle, I'm, I'm not too sure. But um, um, yeah, I mean, I haven't played. A, I, I've played around with different wave numbers of forcing. So I've, I've played around with sort of quite large scale forcing down to very very small scales, and you don't see any differences. Um, but in terms of the isotropy, I'm. I don't think it would make a difference, but I, I can't prove that. Yeah. Uh, can I maybe comment? The, yeah. the time that it would make a difference is if you break KY symmetry explicitly by forcing. Like you force a, 
if like you break the KYC metric, yeah. not just uh, depending on data, but force here differently than here. So yeah, you could do. That would definitely yeah. break symmetry. Mm -hmm. that would yeah. Most certainly you can. But you break symmetry yeah. by hand. There is no then symmetry breaking. It's like you impose broken mm. symmetry in the system. I'm, I am. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm guessing you probably see drifting behavior in pretty much all cases, even if there was like merging and nucleating behavior as well. But again, I I, I can't. I can't prove that. Yes. So two more general mm. questions. Do you have any do you have any comments on this from the point of view of energetics? In what other do words, you mean by energetics? Well, where the energy for the drifting comes from and how and you know how what is the cost of the drifting? <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I don't know. Okay, and is there any sense of a final state? In these stories, in other words, you have these processes of, of of nucleation and mergers and all. Do they go anywhere? No, the system is constantly evolving. So, I mean, in terms of um, the energy of the system, there's a you know it, you define the energy in terms of the kinetic energy, sure. and it reaches an equilibrium level, and that is constant throughout. So regardless of what's going on, dynamically speaking, the total kinetic energy is constant. But the distribution of that between the different modes is constantly changing. Okay. Yeah. And it doesn't go to a, a single distribution and sit there. Mm. No, 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 no. It's the, yeah, the distribution of energy between, for example, the jets, the zonons, uh, the remaining zonal wave numbers, that is constantly evolving, and that depends, it's very closely tied to um, even just the spacing between the jets, if they, if they move away from each other, that can change. Um, if there's a merging event, that changes, etc. Is it ever cyclic? I haven't seen uh, in these stochastic simulations cyclic behavior, no. Because you do have a very well defined one in GPU quasi linear, right? you need at least a generalized quasi linear to get into um, what you just said. Yes, in, in, yes. Yeah, yeah. In quasi linear, you would have a very well defined end state. Yes, yeah. in that sense, yes, you do. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, is there any effort to do LES after generalized quasi linear? to do large AP simulations, because you can get rid of some of the small scales afterwards. You don't need to keep on yeah. using it. Does it change anything? If I you mean, I suppose you could try. Um, I haven't tried that. Is there anyone who tried that? No. Not that I know about. Perhaps somebody else here is aware of that, but I haven't come across any papers looking at that, no. Regarding the porting, uh, so you, you take a, an annular on the, uh, yes. um, how much is it uh, representative of what you, you might expect from experimental uh, uh, observations, or is it some kind of uh, yes. underlying stability that may occur at the really small scale as compared to the Rhine scales, or? Uh, so are you asking how well the forcing model relates to, to real physical systems, is, is that the question? Um, I'm guessing it's not a particularly good representation, because in reality you'll have a wide range of different scales. How wide would you expect it? Would you reach, uh, would it reach the, uh, the upper scales that you... Um, I mean, I suppose in practice this forcing is usually going to be small scale, but how small? Um, I can't. I can't really say. I'm, I'm not really an expert in. Um, when, in when you go in larger yeah. scales, I guess that you, you will be partly losing mm -hmm. the uh, isotropy too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, in terms of symmetry issues. In terms of laboratory experiments, uh, you can actually restrain um, the scale of the forcing quite well in those. So you can actually consider. Uh, small-scale forcing, and there has been, a, I think, a group in Marseille that have done 
those types of experiments. Um, but again, they're, they're sort of trying to simulate what we're seeing in these, these idealized experiments, numerically speaking, and it's probably still a long way away from, from real life. I had a second point. That, well, maybe I completely missed the point, but so you, you, you understood how to recover uh, the uh, migration uh, by uh, generalizing the yeah. VR3. Uh, but how do you uh, figure out uh, uh, in which, I mean, why migration occurs in at certain points and why it doesn't in other uh, part of the parameter space? That's a good question. Um, and maybe, I mean, uh, my feeling is that there's some sort of kind of um, dependency because it's related to the spacing of the jets. My feeling is that in certain parameters, the ideal spacing of the jets doesn't quite divide the discrete domain size and I think it's when you're like transitioning from for example one to two jets that you're seeing it happen um, but I wouldn't like to say more than that um, it, it, it does occur sort of over quite large percentage of the parameter space but there are these sort of discrete bands where you don't see it and I never quite fully understood why that was the case. It, it wouldn't be something to, to, uh, to learn regarding uh, global warming and the, uh, <laughs> possibility, the possibility to have a, a change of... Uh... <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the, sort of, away, the yeah. connection to global warming is a little bit tenuous, I'm afraid. <laughs> Maybe in the May workshop when we do the climate applications and that show of turnips. <laughs> he wants money from you, Bruce. <laughs> yes. Um, is the slowness of uh, Jupiter's, uh, the change of Jupiter's uh, patterns uh, consistent with your scalings? Other what? Sorry. Uh, I, uh, is, can you explain the slowness of? Jupiter to change. Yeah, so um, on Jupiter, the jets have very, very high zonostrophy. So the jets are very strong compared to the eddies. Okay, and we observe with very high zonostrophy cases that the time scales of evolution are much, much longer. So um, two decades in the case of Jupiter may be a very short time scale. It might be that they are very slowly evolving, but we're just not seeing it um, you know, over the course of um, our lifetime, for example. Yeah. We have an estimate of that number on Jupiter. What was yeah, it? so, I mean, I've seen numbers quoted anywhere between five and 10. Yeah, but basically it's significantly greater than what we see on Earth. What would, that, what would that mean for a time scale? I, I wouldn't like to say, I'm not too sure. I don't think anyone's actually estimated that, actually, thinking about it. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, just jumping yes. on what you answered yeah. uh, regarding Yannick's question. Uh, I'm not sure you understood the point. Unless you're mistaken, everything that you do is double periodic. It is, yeah. yes. So why? Would you say that the jet somehow is at odds with the box that you are trying to fit in you know, mm. a certain number of layers <laughs> yeah. in a certain so box? Size? Even though it's doubly periodic, you're kind of restricting yourself to only discrete wave numbers in your box. Okay. Mm. So, say you have a box that's um, of, uh, I don't know, scale like um, unity in length scale, but um, the spacing between your jets is like preferred to be something like 0 0.6, which doesn't divide into unity. So how are you going to fit those jets into a domain of that size? That's 
basically what I was trying to allude to. You run it in a bigger box. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Lots of